My name is Barbara Cottrell, and I'm the Public Lectures Coordinator for the Seniors College of Nova Scotia. And on behalf of uh, the Seniors College, I'd like to welcome you all today and thank you for joining us. Um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging we are on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The treaties were signed in 1725 and we affirm that we are all treaty people and we have a commitment to these treaties. Today, we're going to learn the story behind the conviction of Viola Desmond in 1946 that gained worldwide attention. We'll learn how being arrested and imprisoned affected Viola and how at a ceremony in Province House in 2010, Viola Desmond was granted a free pardon by the Nova Scotia's Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Dr. Mayan Francis. Dr. Francis was the first African Nova Scotian and only the second woman to be appointed as Lieutenant Governor for the province of Nova Scotia. She has received many awards for her work, including the Order of Nova Scotia. The most recent award she's received is the Frank McKenna Award for her outstanding contribution to public policy. We are honored today to have Dr. Francis with us to tell us about the conviction and pardon of Viola Desmond. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone on this wonderful day, even though it's raining, it's still a great day and I'm very happy to be here with you this afternoon. I acknowledge our presence in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I also want to acknowledge my ancestors and all those warriors who fought for justice and equality. It is their determination and fighting spirit that gives me the strength and courage to climb and soar as they would want me to do. I stand on their shoulders and I thank God for my many blessings. I wanna thank the Senior College Association Nova Scotia for the invitation to speak to you today about Viola Desmond and my connection. Quite honored to be here. Tomorrow, November the 8th, it will be 76 years since she was arrested and falsely accused because of the color of her skin. Viola Desmond, a black woman. I will begin my lecture with a brief introduction about my journey, which connects me to Viola Desmond. I am the daughter of immigrant parents. My father, the late Reverend Canning George Francis, was born and raised in Cuba. His family moved to the United States when he was an adult. His father, however, died in Cuba. My mom, Thelma Dolores Francis, was born in Antigua. She immigrated to the United States when she was about 18 years old. Now I was born and raised in Sydney, Nova Scotia, Whitney Pier, which is Cape Breton Island, nine months before Viola Desmond, a black businesswoman, was arrested on November the 8th, 1946. She was later convicted for sitting in a whites only section in a movie theater in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Who could have guessed that my life and Ms. Desmond's life 
would merge in 2010 after so many generations. I grew up in a diverse community of immigrants in Whitney Pier. We lived in harmony with non-Black immigrants, people who had come from different parts of the world in search of employment and a better life for themselves and their children. People left their homes in places like Poland, Ukraine, and Lebanon and crossed the ocean to come to Cape Breton. There were Acadians, Jewish people, and West Indians who lived in the descendants of earlier waves of Scottish and Irish immigrants. Many immigrants found jobs in the Sydney steel plant. Some were also entrepreneurs. We were a strong, hardworking, and closely knit community. In my memoir, I tell how whenever my sister and I outgrew our clothes, our mom gave them to families in need. The color of our neighbor's skin did not matter. All that mattered was they were in need of clothing. I credit my acceptance of people regardless of their background to growing up in a diverse community of Whitney Pier. When I was asked to be Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia in 2006, I was surprised and nervous. I thought about my parents and the warriors who fought for equality and justice for Black people. As I said in my memoir, and I quote, there I was, a Black woman from humble beginnings, sitting with the Prime Minister who had selected me to be the Vice Regal representative. Not only was I surprised, I was also gripped with fear. Would the people of Nova Scotia accept the Black woman as their Lieutenant Governor? You see, racism was at that time and still is alive and well. I would be the first Black person in Nova Scotia and the second Black person in all of Canada to receive the high honor of Lieutenant Governor. I knew that regardless of my answer, my life would be impacted forever. As Black people, you see, we are aware of the psychological impact that racism and discrimination has had not only on us, but society as well. In order to understand racism and discrimination, everyone, regardless of color, must go all the way back to the days of slavery and understand the negative impact of slavery on today's society, as well as yesterday's society, and future society. The impact of slavery from generations ago on our world today is demonstrated by systemic discrimination, white privilege, racism, unconscious bias, microaggression, stereotyping, and keeping power out of black hands by keeping society divided. Because of my faith in God, I knew I would be steered in the right direction. 
Within 48 hours of being asked, I accepted the invitation to be Lieutenant Governor. I have no regret. It was an honor for me to represent our late majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth II's death on September the 8th, 2022, deeply saddened me because of my positive feeling about her and how she always, always demonstrated her sincere respect for me when I spent time with her. She will be in my heart forever. As the first black person to be Lieutenant Governor and second woman, the course of my life, as well as the history of Nova Scotia was changed forever. Now in 2010, as Lieutenant Governor, I became part of the history of Viola Desmond. Who was Viola Desmond? Unfortunately, there are many people who do not know her story. You see, she is part of Nova Scotia's history as well as Canada's history. Viola Desmond is the first woman after Queen Elizabeth II to be on Canadian money, our $10 bill. Viola was born July the 8th, 1914, here in Halifax. She was one of 15 siblings who were successful entrepreneurs. All her siblings are deceased. Wanda Robson, her younger sister, died in Cape Breton on February the 7th, 2022, at the age of 95. Back in the early 1900s, Viola first began her career as an educator. Even though Black people were denied entry into the teacher training school in Truro, Viola studied through correspondence course, wrote the provincial tests, and obtained her certificate. She, along with other Black teachers, were permitted to teach only in Black schools. After reading an article about Madam C.J. Walker, the first Black female millionaire in the United States, Viola's dream developed. In the early 1900s, you see, Madam Walker developed beauty products and beauty training schools for Black women. Being inspired by Madam Walker, Viola saved all of her money, then went away to study at a beauty school in Montreal because the beauty schools here in Halifax were restricted to whites only. Viola was a hard working entrepreneur with a dream and a vision for success. She was unique because she was a successful black businesswoman during a time when race relations in the province were dismal. Her determination, intelligence, and business acumen matched by her drive to succeed in the face of racism and discrimination is a testament of the type of person Viola was. She understood the value of hard work and empowerment. Her parents gave her a solid foundation and support she needed to keep her dream alive. I want to share with you some words written by a Dr. Christian Williams, managing director and principal researcher at Prudentia Institute 
here in Halifax. Dr. Williams is the woman who nominated Viola to be inducted into the Business Hall of Fame, which was a successful nomination that took place in 2021, right here in Nova Scotia. Dr. Williams, who is white, saw Viola's portrait in Government House. And by the way, we're friends. She wondered who this black woman was. She did her research about her and was deeply moved. She then decided that Viola would be part of her doctorate degree. Dr. Williams said this, and I quote, her business was the first of its kind in Canada. But after establishing her beauty salon, she expanded to include various product lines and a training school, three effective business verticals. She did all of this with an image of self-confidence, respectability, and independence. She said we must also appreciate what her work did for other women in her community who were suffering the same intersectional barriers which were compounded by traditional post-war contours of life which offered limited employment opportunities for women. This was Dr. Christian's comment. And Dr. Christian, I have to credit, we just, we didn't know each other that long and we only got to know one another after she did see the picture of Viola in government house and wonder, who is this black woman? Good for her, honest. Viola's business was the first of its kind in our province and our country. Not only did she have the beauty salon, she expanded her business and had products like she had wigs and makeup and training schools. As quoted in Reynolds and Robson's book about Viola, they said, she did all of this with an image of self-confidence, respectability, and independence, end of quote. Viola stands out, not only because she was a modern woman, long before such concepts became popularized in the 1960s alongside the formal civil rights movement, but because she was also successful as an African Nova Scotian entrepreneur and a rare female business leader and mentor. Viola's legacy includes her enterprises, which expanded beyond the Maritimes and lasted for nearly two decades. But it also includes her many graduates who establish professional businesses of their own here in Halifax and other parts of Canada. Everything changed Viola's life in 1946. As a successful businesswoman, she decided to expand her business. On November the 8th, she headed to Sydney, Cape Breton, of course, where I was born. Unfortunately, her car developed mechanical trouble in New Glasgow. Since her car would take several hours to be repaired, she decided to go to the movie. The movie's name was The Dark Mirror at Roseland Theater in New Glasgow. Because she sat in the whites only section in the Roseland Theater, she was arrested, assaulted, and thrown into jail. It costs more, you see, to sit in the white section, but the clerk would not accept her money to pay the difference in price. Subsequently, she was charged with fraud and wrongly convicted of tax evasion of one cent. 
Now, why did she sit in the white only section? She sat there because she had poor eyesight. She wanted to be closer to the screen because you see the movie theater, that particular theater, black people had to sit in the balcony, not downstairs. She sat there because of her poor eyesight. In 1999, I was appointed director and chief executive officer of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. It was my responsibility to uphold the spirit of Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom and to champion human rights and social justice in Nova Scotia. As the first African Nova Scotian Lieutenant Governor, my passion for human rights motivated me to promote justice and equality in, for all in this province. Thus, I granted the Royal Prerogative of Mercy free pardon to Viola Desmond on the advice of the provincial government's executive council on August 15, 2010, 64 years after she was falsely convicted. Now behind me, go this way, you can see part of the, oh, it's gone? Oh, there it is. It, yeah, you can see some of it there anyway on the TV with the Viola Desmond, that's the Royal Product of, of Mercy that, that signed. Did you wanna show more of it? Yeah, you can put it right here if they wanna see more of that too. That's the official piece. Thank you. That's good. That's the first of its kind here in, in, in Canada, actually, we were the first. Maybe there's others now, I don't know, but we were the first to do that for Viola. Now, the government under former Premier Daryl Dexter issued an apology to Viola's family for her wrongful conviction on the same day, April the 15th, 2010. The day represented the unwavering recognition of her innocence and wrongful conviction in 1946 and righted a wrong that never should have happened. The free pardon is only granted to someone who is innocent. And I, you have to know also when I say that she was dragged out and thrown into jail, she was also injured. There is an undeniable link that will last forever between Viola, Desmond, the Crown, private business, provincial, federal and municipal governments, government house and me personally, the first black Lieutenant Governor who granted the free pardon to an innocent black woman. When Viola was inducted into the Business Hall of Fame last year, they said this, and I quote, Viola's recognition helps to right a wrong, namely challenge our lack of appreciation and understanding for models of female leadership and black entrepreneurship and their valuable contributions to our knowledge of entrepreneurship, leadership, management, and organizations, end of quote. The use of the Royal Prerogative of Mercy Free Pardon for Viola Desmond was historic and the significance of our connection to each other cannot be denied or ignored. It is like a circle had been completed between the promise of her brave stand for equality and social justice and my appointment to the vice regal office. The circle is a confirmation for future generations to understand the importance of inclusiveness that ensures our history of exclusion, racism, 
and discrimination is never repeated. History is filled with tales of injustice. It is only on rare occasions with the clarity of hindsight and the benefit of careful thought and measured reason that society comes together to undo the wrongs of the past. Unfortunately, we will never know to what heights Viola would have taken her business. Did that cruel act on November the 8th, 1946, and its aftermath break her spirit and crush her dreams? There is sufficient research that points to the negative impact of racism on one's mental and physical health. Her marriage suffered and her family became very concerned about the high profile of court case. Ultimately, Viola closed her business, moving first to Montreal and then to New York in 1955 to pursue other business interest. Viola died in New York City on February the 7th, 1965, at the age of 51, 19 years after her arrest and wrongful conviction. Her death was the result of gastrointestinal bleeding. Viola was attempted to grow her business in 1946. Imagine for a moment the empire she could have built by continuing her work. Imagine how her successful business could have contributed to the economy and cultural fabric of our province and our country. Imagine the number of people, regardless of color, she could have inspired to become entrepreneurs. Her sister, the late Wanda Robson, describes her sister as a young woman who was committed to learning. She did what was necessary to chase her dream and learn and grow as a professional in her field, an entirely new industry in Canada. As an entrepreneur and business owner, she was very focused. Even there for her customers came first and second or a third was herself. She was dedicated and hardworking. She worked full days, six days, right through. Her reputation was everything. Her image appeared on all of her products, which she made by hand. Her name was associated with all of her business activities, whether it was a salon, training school, and product sales. She was an innovator and craftswoman committed to quality. Viola also made hair pieces, falls, wigs, and chickens. And I have to say, Viola was also involved in real estate. So, as I said, she was quite the entrepreneur. When I freed her, I said this, it is impossible that with the stroke of a pen and the granting of a free pardon, history is forgotten and the proverbial slate is wiped clean. On the contrary, the very moment in Viola Desmond's story will ensure her legacy lives on in legal journals, in newspapers, in human rights research, in political science debates, and in race relations studies. The undeniable link 
between the former Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia and a historic use of the Royal Prerogative of Mercy Free Pardon for Viola Desmond is hard to ignore. This connection between Viola and me is preserved for future generations. My connection to Viola will live on forever. I currently and presently make many speeches about her because I truly believe her story is important and very remarkable. It is an extremely important aspect of Canadian history. Her sister, the late Wanda Robson, made Viola's story known. She was the person who influenced and pressured government to recognize that her sister Viola was wrongly convicted. Subsequently in 2010, on the advice of the government, I granted Viola her freedom, as I said earlier. Currently I'm working on a project that will continue to not only promote and educate people about Viola, but also her sister, Wanda. In the words of Nelson Mandela, there is no easy walk to freedom anywhere. And many of us will have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death again and again before we reach the mountaintop of our desires. In closing, please remember, Viola is not only a social justice icon, she was an innovator and successful entrepreneur. Viola is a very important aspect of Canadian history. There are scholarships named after her in universities, for example, Cape Breton University, St. Mary's University, universities in Ontario. There is a Viola Desmond chair in Cape Breton University and Dalhousie University has a Viola Desmond legacy lecture series. On August the 12th, 2022, to acknowledge her greatness and the effect she has had on race relations in Nova Scotia and Canada, the Historic Sites and Monument Board of Canada and the federal government unveiled a plaque of a dynamic, brave, courageous, and successful entrepreneur, Viola, who was the catalyst, she was the catalyst for tearing down written and unwritten policies of segregation, discrimination and racism in Canada. The unveiling was another page in the history and story of Viola Desmond. The plaque was unveiled in New Glasgow on the building that used to be the Roseland Theater. On the 75th anniversary of her arrest, a bus was unveiled at the Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute by former Senator Wilfred P. Moore on November the 8th, 2021. On November 23rd this year, there will be an unveiling ceremony of Viola by the North End Business Association. She also has schools named after her in Ontario. She has a ferry boat here in Nova Scotia named after her. And of course, she's on our $10 bill. There are conferences about her in Ontario and also here in Nova Scotia. There are many discussions and presentations about her that promote change. Her history will be with us for generations. And what I'd like to do now, before I answer any questions that you may have, I just want to encourage you about some books about Viola. That would be great if you were to, your interest, I'm assuming it is, um, to read about her. And the first book, that I'm going to show you. Um, this book um, is called Sisters to Courage by her sister, Wanda. 
It's a great book. And the second book, um, Viola Desmond, Her Life and Times by Dr. Graham Reynolds and by Viola Desmond, by, by Wanda Robson, of course. That's another one, this way. Back this way, hold on, okay, let's see. Better? Okay. <laughs> and then the other one is Viola Desmond's Canada by Dr. Graham Reynolds again. Okay. So these are three books that are very, very good. And the, uh, I just want to also mention some other books that I hope that you would find interesting as well. And they're memoirs. Okay. Memoirs written by Nova Scotians recently. My one. Man, Francis, An Honorable Life. And then the other one is by Senator Oliver, A Matter of Equality. Excellent, excellent book. And then the third one is called Where Beauty Survived by Dr. George Elliott Clark. Okay, so those books that I just mentioned, you don't have to get mine if you don't want to. <laughs> but they're they're all they're books that give good history information that hopefully you're interested in. So I'm going to stop here and accept any questions that you might have to answer. You might have to ask me, I should say. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Francis. That was a wonderful talk. I you for me certainly you brought. Viola Desmond alive as a person rather than just a name that we hear about. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful to you for that. Mm -hmm. I would invite people to um, write their questions in the chat or the q and either one, and I will read them out. Um, I have one uh, that says bravo and thank you from another proud peer girl. <laughs> Ah, Whitney Pierre, hi, how are you? <laughs> and uh, Charlene Morton has thanked you for the book suggestions and for the details of Viola Desmond's life. I wonder if you could tell me a little, or tell us a little bit more about what you think the impact of the um, the prosecution of Viola was on her business. Did her business stop then, or was she putting a lot of time in on on the um, the sentence, the conviction, or do you think it was just her spirit that was crushed? That's a very interesting question, and and I, I think it's, a, it's 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 both probably because um, I, I remember when I asked her sister, the late Wanda. I said, why did her business, why does she not really continue to promote her business? And, she, and her sister's answer was, she was tired. And when you start reading about what happened to her um, after she was arrested, thrown in jail, um, and people were fighting, like the Olivers, um, um, were fighting for her, for freedom. And there was also um, a, a doctor that was helping, well, they had to get her all better and everything else. So, I mean, it was, all of this pressure, and it put pressure on her marriage, put pressure on her health, put pressure on the family, and that I can understand her why she felt tired. And you just don't know that if you're, if you're not black or you haven't experienced racism or discrimination, there is a psychological effect that hits you, especially if during a time you don't have anybody to talk to or you don't have a doctor to go to in terms of the, what happened to you and why you might be feeling that way. So I would think that all of that was part of it. I have no solid evidence of it, but the mere fact that she was tired, that her marriage was, was having, she was having trouble with her marriage as a result of this, that takes to the connection. Because don't forget she was physically injured as well. So she had to be psychologically injured as well. She, she was doing great on her business. She didn't even try to go back to Cape Breton again. That speaks volumes. So that, and, and there is, as I said in the speech, that there is research that does show what the impact of racism and discrimination has on people. And it would be the same for discrimination, whether you're female or some, something else, you can have a psychological impact. So I would say that's what happened to her. And then she decided to start um, studying business for 
doing other things like which would be what she did in, in the United States was um, being the leader and guide for um, actors and so forth. But in any event, how well that was going, I don't know. But she died by herself in her apartment. And that's pretty sad. So I, I would think that all of this was um, had impact on her. Yeah, yeah. I think that we so often hear about people who make these huge sacrifices and we don't think about the personal impact that that, that has on them. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, we have another um, comment from Joyce Nimmo, who says, thank you for bringing the person to the face. And I think that is a really important thing you've done for us today is to bring Viola Desmond as a person to us. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions, if anybody has anything they would like to ask Dr. Francis before we let her go. Um, there is a question from Cheryl. When were black students first admitted to the Teachers College in Nova Scotia? I don't. Oh, recording my speech keeps coming up. All right. I don't have the date for that, but but it was a while. It took a while. It was it wasn't until I think sometime in the '60s or even after that. Because um, I do remember some people who wanted to study um, to be a teacher and they didn't know where they can go and study it. Um, so it, it was it was a while. That's unfortunate. But it did eventually um, happen that they were got in there to study. But if they didn't get into study at, at Toro College, they did what she did and they take course corresponding courses and write write um write exams for that and, and successful than they teach. And the only place they could teach was in black schools. Dr. Francis, um, Cheryl Nickerson has left a message saying thank you for an amazing talk today. And it certainly was. And Sylvia asks, how can we in contemporary day advance uh, Viola Desmond's legacy? This is a story that everyone should hear about and should know about. And not least is the racism that was experienced by people then and probably what is happening today. And we wonder how, how we can keep this story going. Reality for Viola Desmond is, first of all, she's on that $10 bill. And when you be curious to want to know, well, who is this person? Um, she's a Nova Scotian. Who is she? But also, Viola Desmond is part of history, and she should be in the schools. It should be in schools, whether it's got a children's book, whether it's a historic book, starting from young age right up. And the fact that she was the first person in this country to have the Royal Prerogative of Mercy Free Pardon. She's the first. That's history. That is history. And here she was um, convicted of, uh, for one penny when people when they refused to take her penny. This is history, and not, not only um, the, the, what happened to her, but the fact is that she was an extremely intelligent person, and she was an entrepreneur. She was, um, she was also a school teacher. She was somebody who just was, um, uh, I would say, ba way back then, a feminist, long before that term ever came up. But she was just somebody who, just, and she cared about many people. But her history has to be there and people really should want to go and read about her. If you see a place named after her, which you're going to see quite a bit, well, who is she? You should know the history of Viola because there's a lot of lessons to be learned in it, um, especially to find out, well, how, what is the impact of racism and discrimination on anybody? Um, whether, whether, it's, whether you're Black, you're Indigenous, whether you're gay, whether you're lesbian, whatever it is, um, disabled, racism and, and discrimination hurts. Okay, I've experienced racism and discrimination throughout my journey. And, and that's my story in my, in my memoir. And um, fortunately for me, I have a strong faith in God. And if it wasn't for my strong faith in God and close friends and people who were strong uh, mentors behind me, I don't know what would have happened to me. But my faith in God kept me going forward. And in today's world, as a senior citizen, do I still experience racism? The answer is yes. 
And so again, is my strength and power with God that keeps me going. That's wonderful, yeah. Um, Anne Brennan has written, thank you, Dr. Francis. I feel closer to the story and character of Viola Desmond and having this information in schools is very critical. It's so critical. Um, I would agree, and um, and I hope we can we can make that happen. Right. Uh, and I think that's something we can all do is by putting some pressure on on the authorities to to make sure that happens. Also, because you see that I'm sorry, but that story um, helps you to learn and move forward, right? Um, for change or for making things better um, in life. And so I, I think you learn from these stories, you learn and you admit we made a big mistake. We don't want, because because all aspects of her story, there's, there's um, violence by the police officers against her. There's lies, there's, you know, and, you know, and taking a road, even though she had bad eyesight, that's why she was sitting in that role. So, I mean, there's so much to learn. And the fact that um, she didn't expand her business anymore after that, because I think that would have been a major contribution to this province and to our country. Um, the mere fact that that did not happen, um, those are things you have to learn and understand. And I have a very close friend. She passed away, unfortunately, um, several years ago, um, early death of, due to cancer, of course. She was influenced in Ontario, originally from Fall River, but then moved to Ontario. She was influenced, she told me, by Viola when she read about Viola and her success. And guess what? She became a success way up there, known nationally and internationally, and she did exceptionally well um, in the area, but she expanded the beauty business and she became a very wealthy person, family. So. Um, that would have been for me seeing what Viola would have done for people in her age group way back then. But anyway, um, my friend who was a very successful businesswoman unfortunately died early. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. I I can't thank you enough for doing this for us today. This has been an amazing talk. Um, I'd also like to thank Bill Lee and Bob Russell, our tech people and Susan Letson, our Liverpool um, coordinator who suggested that we invite you. And I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Francis, for that. I'd ask wow. everybody watching today to keep an eye on the SCANS website because we will have more lectures coming up soon. And uh, we hope that you will join us. So again, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.